So I have to give a little disclaimer before we start this morning. Um, I love my wife so much, and she is like a huge comfort for me all the time. So much so that we've even said in ministry that on Sunday morning, um, there were times in our life where she would be so busy doing other things on Sunday morning, and I got to where I was like, there's just something different when you're in the room and when you're not. And so she started making it a priority to be in the room on Sunday mornings, and um, that was, has been huge for me. And so today, I tell you that to say, um, she's not here today, she's in Oklahoma <laughs> And uh, so I'm going to be all over the place. And, and not to, not, if that's not enough, um, my wife leaves town. And as soon as she, like, gets over the Gulf of Mexico, one of our daughters gets sick. And so, so I'm here. Mindy is not. And my daughters are over in my office because one of them's sick, Right? And uh, so if I'm not here today, hopefully you'll understand. Is that what I'm trying to say? Like my mind might be in one of those other two places for at least for moments at a time, you know, and then it'll, it'll come back. It always does. That's kind of how my brain works. So, so we should be good. I just wanted to give you that, you know, if I all of a sudden just space out, that's why, and, uh, and we'll be okay. Uh, you know, I think that I really feel like this morning, I started by saying I love my wife so much because I'm pretty sure that her and God are in cahoots. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean that um, she's always telling me, James, like, you can't live without me. And I'm like, oh, I believe that. You know, I'm like, yeah, but, I, you know, sometimes when she's like going to go away, I'm like, I'm going to prove to her, not that I would, could live without her, but that I can make it for, you know, 48 hours, something like that. I can't. I can't. And so... Um, I, that's why I said I think her and God are in cahoots because, like, you know, I was like, I got this. We got this. And I kept telling the girls, like, we got this. And one of them looked at Mindy and said, are you really going to leave us alone with him? <laughs> and I said, what, what is that? And they go, well, Dad, last time Mom left, remember, it was chaos. I'm like, what? I don't remember that at all. And they were like, it was. I was like, okay, whatever. So anyway. That's where we are right now. We're in the middle of chaos, but um, it's all good. And so I might be a little bit distracted today. We're right in the middle of this series and this talk on community with emphasis on unity. And if you remember, we were talking about um, that as people of God, how will we be known? We're going to be known as people of love. Like, at least that's what Jesus tells us. In John, the 13th chapter, um, starting with verse 34, Jesus says, so talking to his disciples, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Let me, let me say that again. I always pause in the wrong place on this, okay? So here, we, here it is. Love each other, love each other, period, okay? Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples, so we talked about how we as people of God, as kingdom people, as followers of Jesus, that we ought to be basically wearing a name badge of love. This says, this is how you know that I'm a Jesus person, is by how I love you and how you love me and how we love each other, right? And so two weeks ago, you may remember that we um, were looking at the passage that talked about if we remember that we have anything or that anyone has anything against us. And we're about to bring our sacrifices before God. That we should pause on that. We should put that on hold. And go and make things right with other people relationally. And then come back and offer our sacrifices. And so we were about to take communion. And we said, okay, we're going to pause for a minute. And last week we came back and shared in communion together. And I really thought that last week was really a special time. I don't know about you, but it just felt like that communion was a little more um, thoughtful for me last week. I can only speak for myself. And so I just thank God for that. And we talked about how the communion, like in that, God is saying, you know, don't worry. Like, I need you to follow through with my commands. Because this stuff, the, the sacrifice, the, the religious things, 
can wait because really our religion is lived out in the way that we treat people, right? In our relationships. And so we're not known as the people who take communion. We're known as the people who love. And so we should always put a priority <clears throat> on love. So today we're going to pick up where we were supposed to be last week. In a passage of scripture that is one of the hardest for me. Um, and I think it's one of the hardest for most people. I'm going to ask that if somebody would just volunteer to go get me a cup of water or a bottle of water. Um, I usually have one, and I did not get it this morning in all the chaos, and somebody's getting it. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so, you know, should we wait on them, you know? Like, they're going to miss out or not? I don't know. It's like when you, you know, ask somebody to get something from the table, and it's like you realize you haven't prayed, and you're like, oh, should we wait and pray when they get back? It's kind of how I feel right now. This is what my mind does most of the time. <laughs> so we're not, we're not going to wait on them. They'll be, they'll be fine. So um, this passage of Scripture, though, is one of the hardest for us to live out as followers of Jesus. I'm just going to put that out there. And I'm going to say that um, in all of my experience, this is one that um, is just really tough for people to do. Okay? So I want to talk about how we usually handle. Yeah, I'm, I'm just really struggling. <clears throat> maybe we do. Maybe I need to wait, right? We're going to wait. Um, I think water will do me good. It's all right. <laughs> Ivy walks in and she's like, what is going on? <clears throat> My goodness, it's even louder with the microphone. It's, no, that's actually better. I'll meet you halfway. Okay. Let's see if I can drink both of these this morning. Don't look. <laughs> oh, so much better. All right. So how do we normally navigate relationships and conflict? This is um, something that we see it all the time. It's all over the place, right? Um. We get our feelings hurt, things go wrong, um, someone says something that maybe kind of cuts us the wrong way. I, I've become so aware of this in my own life that many times I'll even say to someone whenever I'm talking to them, please don't hear what I'm not saying, right? Have you ever felt like that? Because sometimes even in giving a compliment, we don't know how people receive it, and so it can almost, you know, things can cut us. And I actually think that that's one of the tools of our enemy you know, we've said that <clears throat> we have an enemy whose goal in life is to steal, kill, and destroy the lives of, of God's people. And so he would stop at nothing to tear us apart, right? And so oftentimes this happens relationally with us. And so, you know, what do we do when things are not going great relationally? Well, we would obviously we would never do this as people of God, the way I'm about to explain it, although we do. I'm just being a little bit sarcastic or facetious, all right? So oftentimes we hear, we, we get hurt. And what, what do we immediately do? We go and we tell somebody. We, we get one of the people that are closest to us maybe, and we're like, you're never going to believe what just happened to me. Like this person hurt me. They said this, they said that, or, or the other. <clears throat> and you're never going to, like just... And it feels good, right, to be able to talk to someone and tell them that we're hurt. The problem is, is that's the exact opposite of what the Word of God tells us to do. Um, my girls and I were watching Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, all right? One of my favorite movies of all time. The Gene Wilder one, right? Not the Johnny Depp one. And they're both good, but like the Gene Wilder one's just way better, okay? To, in my opinion. And one of the best lines in that whole movie, he says it a couple of times, and Nora has started saying it like throughout the day. She'll say, um, strike that, reverse it. Yeah, you ever, did you ever notice Willy Wonka saying that? He'll, he'll say something like he says, um, we, have, um, we have so much time and so little to see. 
strike that, reverse it, because he means they have so much to see in such little time, right? So this is what I'm trying to tell you this morning, is that in the church, the way that we normally handle conflict and relationships, I'm just going to be straight up. We need to strike it, and we need to reverse it, okay? And we're getting ready to read some scripture that tells us how we're supposed to do this stuff, but we've really got to take this to heart and understand, listen, this is not just a suggestion, this is a command, okay? So we're going to go to Matthew, the 18th chapter. And you've heard me talk about this before because any time that I talk about us being obedient and living out the commands of God, I almost always bring up Matthew 18. Why? Because I think it's one of the hardest things for us to do as followers of Jesus, okay? But it's so important. Matthew Chapter 18, we're going to be in verse 15, starting with verse 15, and we're going to go through 20. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this. If two or more of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Let's pray. Father, as we go into this passage this morning, my prayer, Holy Spirit, is that you would just be in this place. That you would um, take my words and that you would use them. God, that you would speak through me and that you would give us um, ears to hear your word. That you would help us to surrender ourselves and our normal behaviors and adopt um, your commands for our lives. God, we want to be a people um, that are known by love. And you've given us clear instruction as to how to do that. And so we just ask that you would move in this place, but not only that, that you would move in us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in Matthew 18, Jesus gives us some clear instructions on how we're supposed to live out conflict within our relationships. He says, first of all, that if anyone sins against you, we should go to them privately, hear that, privately, and point out the offense. And if, if they listen and they confess it to you, then, then like everything's okay and everything's the way that it's supposed to be. But if that doesn't work, then you're supposed to take two or three other people with you and you're supposed to then talk to the person again so that it can't ever be like confused on what was said. Like you have witnesses to what was said and, and that the conversation went the way you said it went. Like that everyone's pure in their motives and all of that. That again, now you have witnesses. And if that doesn't work, then you could take it before the church. That sounds awkward, doesn't it? Take it before the church and settle it there. Before we go any further in this, we have to understand what does this passage of Scripture teach us above all else? Here's what I believe. Matthew 18, this, the, this second part of Matthew 18, teaches us that the relationship is so important. It's of utmost importance. We've been talking about this for the last several weeks, just how, what a priority God puts on relate, the relationships of his children. And in Matthew 18, we see that yet again. Jesus says, listen, this might sound really awkward, but I want you to do conflict like this. Why? Because, remember, go back a couple of weeks. Because it's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's not about who, who gets theirs. It's not about who is higher and who's lower. What matters is, is that the relationship is repaired. And so, that means that you don't get to put people down behind their back. It doesn't mean that you can talk about what people have done to you. 
It doesn't mean that that you can rally up a group of friends. It doesn't even mean that you can tell the whole church so that someone else could be put out. What it means is, is that first you start with them. And he says that you go to them and you do it right in privacy. You do it together, like not blasting it out in front of everyone else. Like you do this between you and that person privately and you point out the offense. And if and the goal is that they would listen and that they would confess and that the relationship would be repaired. We can see that that's the goal, right? And so as we do this, the whole point is that God is saying community is so important that I want you to behave and do things differently than the people of the world do them. Because I'm going to be straight up. This does not happen in the world. And it's the reason why we don't, by default, do relationships this way. Because we're used to it. Like in our families, the family of origin, wherever we come from, we normally do relationships differently, right? Maybe we, we, there's a lot of backbiting and talking about people behind their backs. Or maybe you don't even talk about it at all. Maybe you just push it down and bury it and stuff it and never even talk about it again. And then all of a sudden, one day at a family reunion or something, right, it all blows up, yeah? Like, that's the kind of stuff that happens. What about in our workplace? Not, like, do people do this at the workplace? There's not a whole lot of reconciliation that happens over the water cooler usually. There's a lot of conversation that happens over the water cooler or in the break room. But not a lot of it is reconciliation, right? And so we don't learn this stuff other places. And so this is so unnatural for us. Um, <clears throat> before I was a, a senior pastor, I was a youth pastor and I was teaching this passage to our students one time. And I just said, you know what? Like, it, in our youth group, like, it was just, the relationships were not great at the moment. And uh, through prayer, I just felt like the Lord was leading me to this passage in Matthew 18. And I said, listen, here's what we're going to do. Anytime that someone comes and talks to you about someone else, the first question we ask is, have you done Matthew 18? And they were like, what do you mean? And I said, well, because they, they would, you know, the students were really smart. And they were like, but Matthew 18 says we can actually take two or three people with us. I'm like, yes, it does. But that's step two. Right? These are like rules of engagement for relationships of kingdom people. And so the first step is to go and talk to that person in private. And so listen, as a community, as a kingdom community, right, we should be able to ask someone, have you done step one? Because it feels like we're entering into step two right now. If a person says, no, I haven't, we're like, we should be able to encourage each other, right? <clears throat> go and do that. Go do step one of Matthew 18. Go and talk to them. I'm going to tell you, it took a while. But <clears throat> us leaders and other students started asking that question. Have you done Matthew 18? And I'm just going to tell you, it radically transformed the relationships within our youth group because people started actually talking to each other about their problems instead of talking to someone else. Can you imagine, like, the difference if we would talk to the person we have a problem with instead of talking about the person that we have a problem with, right? Right? Like, I could harp on this all day long because I really think that this is huge for us as people of God because we are so locked into the behaviors and the customs of the world, right? But Scripture tells us that we're not supposed to conform any longer to the patterns and the behaviors of the world, but that we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing the way that we think, right? By changing the way that we think. And so we've got to be a people who are doing the things of God. I'm so sorry. My cough isn't really as bad as it sounds, I don't think. The thing's just right there, man. Oh, that's brutal. Um, <clears throat> so if we're going to be God's people, we have to do relationships God's way. And so let's just ask ourselves this question. Rhetorical, you don't have to answer it. Nobody raise their hands. But like, what, is it, what would it look like in the last relational conflict that you were involved in what would it have looked like if you had done it the Matthew 18 way? Maybe you did, right? But let's just think about it for a minute. How would things change relationally in those relationships where you have some level of conflict 
if you had done things the Matthew 18 way. Let that sink for a minute. You might find yourself feeling a little bit uneasy because it means that we have to go to the people who have hurt us and we actually have to tell them about it. You know, one of the reasons why we don't do this or the reason why we handle conflict the way that we do is because I think we just want to be seen in conflict. I just want someone to know that I was hurt, right? And so we go tell someone. But the Scripture doesn't actually deny us that. Jesus actually says, actually, you can let people know that you've been hurt, but what I want you to do is let the person know who hurts you. They're the only one who can do something about it, right? This has changed the way Mindy and I parent a little bit, too. So when the girls come to us, and and I mean, like, not like this is like once a week or once a month kind of thing, like four or five times a day, right? (laughs) When they come to us and they're like, Hey, sister did this, right? We say, hey, did you talk to her about it? I mean, I'm, I'm, that makes sound silly, right? But where do we get these habits? They happen to, we, we learn them from very early age, right? So we, we try to parent out of Matthew 18, and there's times where we don't do it right. I'm just going to be honest. But, but we always try to remind ourselves, like, wait, we've got to teach our girls how to handle conflict the biblical way. So whenever someone takes a toy from you, let's just put ourselves in that position. Maybe this will be a little easier for us. When someone takes your toy, what do you do? You say, hey, that didn't feel very good. And I was playing with that. And here's the thing. What we learned so early on is that we can usually get the toy back if we'll just hit them. (laughs) But that doesn't help the relationship. (laughs) What we have learned, especially with our our girls and just kind of observing them is where it all starts to to change is when we say, maybe you didn't mean to, but that thing that you just did hurt me. And let me tell you, church, if we're going to be people who are known by our love for each other, If your brother or your sister in Christ stand face to face with you and say, hey, that hurt. How many of us would just turn our back and walk away? I wouldn't. And I honestly don't think any of you would either. You see, this is what Jesus says. When we look at it through the lens and we understand, like this is what Jesus is asking us to do. It may sound hard. It may even sound divisive. But let me tell you this. It sounds divisive because that's what the enemy is lying to us and telling us. That if we do this, we're going to make things worse. But how is that even possible when Jesus says, this is the way? Right? But we all, when we look at it, we go, you know what? I wouldn't do that. And neither would you. And so no wonder if there is someone who is a part of our biblical, like, faith community, right? Kingdom community that would look you in the eye and say, well, you know what? I know that you say I hurt you, but I don't care. Well, now we can see why Jesus would say, you better go get a couple other people and talk to that person because that doesn't sound like the way we're supposed to be known, right? And can you imagine if, if you took you and a couple of friends that were mutual friends and you went and you talked to, to me and you said, James, what you did last week, it really hurt me. And in, in the last time we talked about it, you said you didn't care. So I brought these people with us because, you know, we think that we really want to work this out relationally. And I said, you know what? I don't care how many people you bring. I still don't care. Okay? Now, I know it sounds crazy, but can you not see why Jesus would go, well, if that person's going to be that hard-headed, you probably just ought to bring them up before the whole body. And let them tell, because here's what Jesus is, is requiring. Listen. Let them tell the whole body, I don't love you enough to confess. Now, if somebody would be willing to do that, this is where Jesus says, if it comes to that, 
you're going to have to turn that person away and treat them like they're, he said, treat them like they're an unbeliever or a pagan, right? Treat them like they're not a part of the kingdom community because guess what? They're not. And that may sound harsh, but how are we known? By our love for one another. So what this actually says is, is that all the people who are wearing the name tag but don't live it, don't get to wear it anymore. And I know that sounds so hard, but haven't we all been there and experienced things within the body of Christ that we're like, man, that just wasn't quite right. Or have we known people that have been hurt by the church? And instead of us like bringing it to the, to the place where we say, this has got to be fixed relationally, we just sweep it under the rug. But what happens? People get hurt, right? And so people are like, well, I don't know if I could ever be a part of the church. We've all heard it before. Because that's just a bunch of, the, the best word or the worst word that you can use against church people. They're just a bunch of hypocrites, right? Well, Jesus says, you're going to be known by your love for one another, and you don't get to be a hypocrite, right? Because that's not what Jesus wants for his church. And so, I think we all understand, like, I don't have to go into, you know, a three-point, or break down all three of these steps in three points, because we get it, right? We talk to the person one-on-one, if the relationship's not repaired, we bring some other people in and we say, hey, let's work this out relationally together. If that still doesn't work, bring it, that doesn't mean you bring them up here on the platform on a Sunday morning. That's not what we're talking about, right? But it means you might actually, like within your small group, like your community, say, we need to work this out relationally. This is so, the relationship is too important. We're not going to bury it. We're not going to sweep it under the rug. Maybe it means that you take some leaders of the church and you say, hey, help us work this out relationally because the it's too important. And that's what Jesus says, is that the relationships are too important to just let them go. We have to be intentional about preserving relationships. Why? Because we're known by our love for one another. Now, there's some other stuff in this passage that we have to hit, and it's huge, and it really gives us an understanding for why this is so important, okay? And so really, you could take everything that we've talked about over the last three weeks and everything that we're talking about today— you can wrap it all up and you can say, this is why it's important. We, we've, we've already said that community and relationship are important. And we can say, well, why? Well, because Jesus says they're important. But why? Well, here, we're getting ready to look at it. Okay, so here it is. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. One of the, probably one of the more confusing passages of scripture, um, because we just don't, it's hard for us to understand what exactly does this mean. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Now, I'm just going to throw this out there and let you know, like, because like I said, this is, this is one of those passages that we read it and we go, what does that mean? You ever, anybody ever wonder that? What does that mean? Whatever we permit on earth will be permitted in heaven, and whatever we forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Some translations will read, like, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, okay? This, I'm just going to throw this out there. This is the way I read this. If you want to disagree with me, I'll say, okay. It's not something that we would, you know, argue about, but th I think this will make sense. Jesus puts this at the end of this passage about how we work relationally, and basically I think what he's, part of what he's saying to us is, listen, church. Whatever you do within your, commun your kingdom community and whatever you do there is the way people see the kingdom. Can we not, we can all agree on that, right? Whatever we do is the way people see the kingdom. And so if we decide to not be transformed by the renewing of our mind and we decide that we are going to conform to the patterns of the world, guess what? The patterns of the world get brought into this kingdom community. But Jesus is saying, listen, I want you to do it my way. But the reality of it is, this is just like he talked to the Israelites as they were going into the promised land. He said, there's certain things I want you to do. I don't want you to marry like with other people. I want you to destroy all the pagan communities that are there. 
I don't want you to worship their gods and their idols. I want you to do things differently. And he says, but listen, I'm just going to tell you, if you don't do it my way, things are not going to work out well for you. And so here Jesus says, there's a way of life that I expect you to live relationally, but I'm just going to warn you, if you let other things in, they're in. So he basically says, the covering of my kingdom community cannot interrupt the consequences of you living by the world standard relationally. Does that make sense? So if we're going to continue to do things the way the world does them, we're going to get what the world gets. And so that's why people look at the church and they go, well, the church is no different than my job Monday through Friday. The church is no different than the sandbar on Saturday, right? The church doesn't look different. Why? Because we've let stuff in that's not supposed to be in. Jesus says, whatever you, whatever you permit, it's going to be there. Whatever you bind up and get out, that's the way it's going to be. And so if we're going to be people who live by kingdom relational principles, what we have to understand is that it will change the way we do relationships. And we really can be a beacon of hope and a light to the world because we're different. But if we're not different, we're not different. So Jesus says, whatever you do here, that's what happens. Whatever you, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Like whatever it looks like for you to live this stuff out, that's what the kingdom looks like. And so it's up to us. It doesn't mean that we're not followers of Jesus if we don't do this stuff. But it also doesn't, it means that we're not living up to the full potential of kingdom people when we don't. And then this next piece, it says, I also tell you this, and this is huge. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. You've probably heard this passage quoted all the time. It's one of our favorites whenever we're in church and we, we have gather people and we're like, we know that God's here because it says that wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, that here he is in the midst of us. And we, we, we quote that and we proclaim it. But let me just say this. Jesus is telling us the reality of our gathering together as kingdom people. And I think this is the reason why he says, I want you to be a people who focus and prioritize relationships. Why? Because when you come together in unity, bound by love, you will have a different kind of experience in the presence of God. That's huge. And you can say, well, James, that, what does that even mean? I'm just going to tell you, I experience the presence of God every day of the week. But I still look forward to being here on Sunday. Because we experience something different when we are with God's people, right? And so Jesus says, I want you to have this fullness of experience I want you to live in the fullness of the kingdom reality. So to do that, you have to live by my truths relationally. Because the reality of it is, is it doesn't matter how many people you put in a room. If none of them like each other and want to sit by each other, it doesn't do us any good, does it? Jesus says, I want you to be a people that are unified around love. And when you do that, listen, church, this is so big. When we do that, we get to see God in a different way. I've mentioned this several times. But do you know that I reflect the image of God in a different way than everyone else here? And Judy, is she sitting right here? Do you know that she reflects the image of God differently than anyone else here? Anyone. Every single person, we could go down every row to every seat and we could point out every person. We could say, each person here today reflects the image of God in a different way than everyone else. So whenever we come together and there's nothing dividing us and there's nothing that's breaking and, and hindering our unity, what that means is that when we come together in that way, we can see God differently than we can on our own. And Jesus wants us to experience the fullness 
of God's presence. So why do we do this stuff? Because community is important. And we usually do the exact opposite in reverse order when it comes to relationships. And it might feel divisive, but it's not. That is a lie of the enemy trying to keep the body of Christ from being exactly what Jesus wants it to be. And and this gives us a picture of what our kingdom communities can be like. Jesus tells us, when you gather together, Two or three of my followers gathered together. I am there among you in a very different way. And in order to to have this, in order to know this and experience this, you're going to have to do relationships differently. Not doing the way of the world, but doing the way of the kingdom. Binding up the things of the world and getting rid of them so that you can live in the truth of the kingdom. And how do you do that? You go talk to each other one-on-one. And so what if we, as a, as a church, I'm just going to be honest, church. I don't think that like, this like, gossip and backbiting is a huge problem at Rock Crusher. I don't. I actually think it's, uh, I think that we're doing good. But we all know, like you know better than I know where you are, okay? So what if we as individuals just said, you know what? relationally, I know that Matthew 18 is not natural. So I'm going to make a concerted effort to do it Jesus' way. Now, what that could mean is, I want to just bring one more thing up, and then we're going to call it good. The last time, that two weeks ago, we said, you know, if you know that anyone has anything against you, right? Matthew 18 doesn't say that. It basically says if you have anything against someone else, like they have hurt you, then it's on you. So guess what? As kingdom people, one of the things that we can know is it's always on us. (laughs) If someone has something against us or if I have something against someone else, you know whose responsibility it is? Mine. It's mine. You know whose responsibility it is? It's yours. You can say, well, they're a follower of Jesus too. Yeah, you know what? It's their responsibility too. But just because it's theirs doesn't mean it's not yours, right? It's ours. We all have a responsibility to preserve the kingdom culture that that God is trying to build up here. And so this is a culture of community, of closeness, of relationship. And Jesus gives us specific instruction on how to live it out. And so what if we were to do that? It's super awkward. And it's really hard. I mean, really hard. There's several people in here right now that are like going like this. Whew. I mean, just, it is so tough. I'm going to tell you something that blows my mind. Every time I say it, I have to check it and go, is that still true? And it's still true. I have never done Matthew 18 and it not work out better than I could have possibly imagined, ever. There have been moments where Mindy and I have been driving to people's house, knowing that we're about to have a a level one Matthew 18 conversation, and we are almost, like you can feel the sick in your neck, right? It's not in your stomach. Like it left your stomach when you left your driveway. When you're pulling into theirs, it's right here, you know? And then we leave going, what just happened? I'm going to tell you what happens. When you do things God's way, he shows up. So we do relationships under his will. And so then we can walk up to people and we can talk to them in humility and love by his authority. And we can, you can sit there this morning, you could be thinking, James, I could never do this. I'll never have the courage to do this. Listen, you don't have to have the courage because you can have his power. And listen, if you're sitting there thinking, but I am just bad with words and I don't do things well relationally. Maybe you're just like, I'm awkward. Okay, I get it. But he's not. 
And so the beauty of this is when we do things God's way, there's something miraculous that happens in the process. And so you can look at this and go, well, that will never work. And I can tell you, I agree. When you just look at it, you go, there's no way that that works. Just strolling up to people and saying, hey, you hurt me. It doesn't work anywhere else, but it works in the body of Christ. Why? Because we're people of love. And that changes everything. So I just want to encourage us, if we're going to be known as people of love, then we have to be willing not only to do what we did a couple weeks ago and go and, and make things right with other people, but it also means that when we have been hurt, we have to be able to tell people, I'm hurt. Because if we don't, the hurt festers and it grows and it consumes the relationship. I heard a wise man once say, like we, when it comes to relationships, we either talk it out or we act it out, right? We don't want to be a people who act out of our hurts and our pains. We want to be a people who are willing to talk through those things and could come to a place of repentance and confession and a willingness to, to grow and learn because love is the priority. And when we do that, we show the world a picture of Jesus. When we do that, we become known as the people of love. And I'm just going to throw one more thing out there. When you do that, you're not a Christian doormat. But you are leading with love. And I'm just going to tell you, when you can talk to people about how they hurt you, guess what? They hurt you less. Because people become aware. And people understand that, can we all just admit, like there's bullies in the world. They don't, they don't stop at school, right? Bullies don't get to be bullies in Matthew 18. See? The community, the culture changes when we do it Jesus' way. Will you stand with me and pray? Father, we um, humbly come before you this morning. And I just want to thank you for your word. Thank you for caring about us relationally. You're not a God who just says, I need you to, to come and, and give sacrifice. You're not a God who just demands uh, our penance. You actually care about our relationships. I don't know any other God that people worship that does that. And so we worship you. We praise you and we thank you. We thank you for the fact that obedience to you is actually better for us. And Father, we ask for supernatural strength and supernatural courage because we know that, that changing the way we do things is not easy. It's like habits and patterns that are hard to break. God, I just ask that you would help us to be a people that lead with love and that live Matthew 18. God, do what only you can do. We surrender to you in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen.